Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webcast, It's All in Your Head. My name is Rida, and I will be the moderator of this webcast, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining in this morning. Today, we'll have Dr. Paul Swingle talk about addiction, and we will especially focus on internet addiction. Let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Swingle for those of you who don't know. Dr. Swingle was titular full professor of psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to moving to Vancouver. A fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association, Dr. Swingle was lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, an attending psychologist at McLean Hospital in Boston, where he also was coordinator of the Clinical Psychophysiology Service. Dr. Swingle is a registered psychologist in British Columbia, certified in biofeedback and neurotherapy. His newest book, Biofeedback for the Brain, was published by Rutgers University Press. The book is available at www.soundhealthproducts.com. Again, that is www.soundhealthproducts.com. Before I invite Dr. Swingle, I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions during this webcast. If you look at the NetViewer control panel on your screen's right side, you will see a tab called Chat. It is the fourth tab from the bottom of the control panel. If you click on that, it will open up a chat box, and that's where you can type your questions. Again, you don't have to wait till, until the end of the webcast to type your questions. You can do so at any time. And without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Paul Swingle. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome everybody to the uh, maiden voyage of our new webcast uh, programs. Today we're going to be talking about addiction. Now this is a huge, huge topic, and we could spend the next two weeks talking about this and still not exhaust everything. Uh, and in future webcasts, we'll be uh, again going over the addiction theme uh, routinely. So uh, what I'm going to be doing today, <clears throat> excuse me, is looking at some of the different forms of addiction, what we know about it, and some things that we can do about it in terms of the neurological conditions that predispose us to addictive behavior. Now, we're going to be talking about the brain, hence the title of the uh, uh, broadcast is It's All in Your Head. Where that originated from, by the way, is um, uh, as a lot of therapists uh, know, we often get people who come in very distraught and uh, they have been told by somebody it's all in your head. My response to that is, of course, where else would it be? So that's where we're going to go to have a look at what the conditions are that, are that predispose us to addictive behavior and some of the things that we can do about it. Now, a broad definition of addiction is some preoccupation that has damaging effects. And it can be anything. It can be alcoholism. It can be drug addiction. It can be prescription uh, drug addiction. It can be sex addiction, it can be internet addiction, it can be addiction to television. And there are a lot of things that can have destructive, uh, deleterious effects on our life. Okay. The first thing I'm going to talk about is prevention. This is the recording of brain activity of a hyperactive child versus a, a, a child who does not have any ADD, ADHD problems. Now, you just look at this recording of the EEG and it is visually apparent that there are pretty substantial differences in the brainwave activity of these two kids. Uh, the one on the right, you can see that the uh, center line here where it says low frequency, there's 
a marked elevation in amplitude with the hyperactive child, much less so with the normal child. And if you look at the very high frequency, which is the bottom tracing there, you can see that the high frequency amplitude is stronger in the normal child relative to the hyperactive child. Okay. Now, what happens if that child goes untreated? <clears throat> These are the uh, factors associated with uh, ADHD that has been untreated uh, in the adult population. First of all, if you look at comorbid mood or anxiety disorders, you're dealing with about 60% of that population has comorbid conditions. Alcoholism and drug addiction is huge in the ADHD population that is untreated adults. Now, it's almost a truism that uh, the reports that we get about individuals in prison, males in prison, the probability that they have identifiable conditions or symptoms that are associated with ADHD, it's huge. Now, if you look at risky behavior, and in this case, the example is risky sexual behavior, you can see this is relative to the general population. There are huge differences here between the untreated ADD and uh, the uh, general population. So when we talk about sex addictions and things of that nature, very often you'll find that these people have a history of the ADHD conditions. Now, if you look at criminal behavior, these are males at uh, the average age 22, and this is greater than the general population, arrested 95% greater than the general population, convicted 155% greater than the general population, imprisoned 800% greater than the general population. Now, a lot of what we can do here in terms of dealing with issues like drug and alcohol addiction is we identify children at risk. One of my missions, and you folks are going to hear this over and over and over and over again if you join our webcast, is <clears throat> neurotherapy, that is what I do, neurofeedback, should be in the schools. It's easy to do. We can train up people to do it. We can identify these kids at risk. We can do a few things for them and really help out and prevent a lot of this before it ever gets to the addiction phase. Now, some generalizations about what we're going to be talking about, the addictions. The first is neurological predispositions. Now, the case that I just, uh, the situation that we just described, there are a couple of things here. One is it is a neurological condition, and the ADHD, the uh, fact that these individuals have marked elevation of slow frequency in the brain means the brain is hypoactive. And the bouncing around and the hyperactivity is the child self-medicating. That is, they are trying to give themselves some stimulation because the brain is understimulated. Now, that's a neurological condition. And we have neurological predispositions to addictive behavior. But there's a secondary factor here. And the secondary factor is if you have ADD, the probability that you're going to have some failures in your life is markedly greater. So in addition to the neurological predisposition, you have the uh, concomitant condition of failure. And failure may be what is responsible for your becoming alcoholic to uh, be able to distract yourself uh, and uh, uh, medicate yourself for your feelings of insufficiency. Uh, distraction. Uh, individuals who get involved with uh, gambling, for example, highly distractive. <clears throat> uh, individuals who spend their life watching TV or on the Internet, these are all highly distractive <clears throat> uh, activities. 
emotional. We're going to look at a lot of conditions that are associated with addiction, primarily depression. So and the use of alcohol, for example, you find that a lot of alcoholics show the markers for uh, predisposition to depressed mood states. <clears throat> Uppers and downers. Uppers are stimulants that people get addicted to, the uh, methyl uh, phenidates, the uh, cocaine derivatives and so forth. Downers, just the opposite side of that, the sedating and antidepressant medications. And the pleasure versus pain. That's a very interesting dynamic in all addictions. You know, with gambling addiction, we find that the rewarding effect uh, is as strong with losing as it is with winning. I know that sounds really peculiar, but the pleasure-pain aspect to addiction is very important. <clears throat> we have this notion that if it's genetic, you can't do anything about it anyway. Well, one of the things that we've learned in neurotherapy is that genetic does not mean in concrete. And the best example of that are the twin studies. If you have identical twins, monozygotic twins, and one of them has schizophrenia, what's the probability that the second one will have schizophrenia? Well, it's about 50%. The interesting statistic is 50% will not. Meaning, of course, that you need something to turn the key for these predispositions mm -hmm. and that the predispositions are correctable. We're going to be talking about very specific areas in the brain during this broadcast. We're going to be talking about the frontal cortex, F3, FZ, and F4 in this diagram. Uh, F3, of course, is the left. F4 is the right. We're going to be talking about an area right over the sensory motor cortex, which is right in the center of the brain. And then we're going to be talking about the occipital region in the brain. This is the, a, the raw data sheet for a 13-year-old male child. Now, I don't know anything about this child when the child first walks in the door, other than he probably is not happy about being here. Uh, he's dragged in by his mother. He kind of slouches in the chair, uh, tries to look disinterested and bored. So there are 99 numbers here, uh, and each one of those is associated with the measurement of amplitude of brain activity in a specific area of the brain. So from these 99 numbers, we break it down to 22. And these 22 numbers tell me everything I want to know about this child. And I'm just going to point out a couple of numbers here to give you an idea of how this proceeds. First, at CZ, now, recall that's the area right uh, above the, uh, right on top of the head, right over the, uh, the midline of the brain. This is the ratio of slow to fast activity. <clears throat> that is, if you remember the first tracings, this is the ratio of uh, the very slow activity relative to the fast activity. It's 2.7. We want that below about 2.2. Now, when he reads, it gets worse. <clears throat> so I know a lot about this child right now. The second thing that I've noticed on this child is that the ratio of slow to fast alpha, slow alpha 8 to 9 cycles a second, fast alpha uh, 11 to 12, and that's a marker of brain efficiency. So there's a lot of other stuff in this record, but this will do for now. I turn to the child and I say, you have a condition in which you find it really difficult to focus and pay attention. And he's starting to look at me now. And I say, but you have a very vicious form of this. And the vicious form of this is the harder you try, the worse it gets. 
you read, you get to the end of the paragraph, you can't, can't remember what you've read. <clears throat> the child is really making an effort now not to cry because, <clears throat> as he told me later, I'm the one guy on the planet who understood what he was going through. Okay. Now, I asked the mother to leave the room. <clears throat> By the way, I've, I've discussed some other things with him, of course. But when she leaves, I say to him, I don't want you to say anything to me, but I want you to just listen. I want you to stop smoking dope. Marijuana is going to make you stupid because what it does is it interferes with a waveform that's associated with brain efficiency. Now, <clears throat> here's a situation in which if you recall the initial uh, table that we had of the consequences of untreated ADD. If this child is not treated for the ADD, then this is the kind of kid that ends up on the pile of social rejects. Becomes alcoholic, perhaps criminal, other drugs, ends up in prison. Okay. These are the kids that we can nail early on and prevent a lot of the problems. So, what I discovered with this child is in this region in the brain right here, he had marked elevation of slow frequency. That's a condition associated with ADD and ADHD. The other thing I noticed is in the front part of the brain, when I was looking at the relationship of slow to fast alpha, I saw that the brain was really sluggish. And I took a chance. I took a risk. I said to the child, I want you to stop smoking dope. The reason for that is marijuana slows down brain activity. And we can pick this up for long periods of time after the, uh, the child is clean. It turns out I was correct. <clears throat> okay. This is a client who has <clears throat> severe depression. And what I want to do is show you what this looks like on a record. Now, remember the record I showed you earlier of the child, uh, the ADD child. Uh, and what we have here is the difference between fast frequency at position F4 relative to F3. And the disparity there is 57.6%. Okay, there it is right there in the summary sheet. And here's the difference. We want those about equal. This is the marker for predisposition to depressed mood states. Okay. Oh, I see what happened. Okay. <clears throat> now, the marker for depression, uh, uh, predisposition to depressed mood states, here's the right side of the brain. And any condition that gives rise to marked elevation of uh, activity of this region of the brain relative to this is your marker for predisposition to depressed mood states. Depression is very highly correlated with uh, addictive uh, uh, predisposition to addiction. Okay. I got myself out of order here, so let me get back. There we go. Okay. And as I showed you on the rotating head, what that means is that this area of the brain is much more active than this. That's your marker for predisposition to depressed mood states. Now, a second condition 
associated with depressed mood states is a marked deficiency of slow frequency in the back of the brain. And this is your uh, profile for the what's called the genetic alcoholic. And the genetic alcoholic, what that is, is a severe inefficiency in the back part of the brain. Now let me get to the Okay. Okay. So, depression, marked elevation of this side of the brain relative to that. The genetic marker for alcohol, alcoholism is a problem in the back of the brain, and that's the one we're going to have a look at now. Okay, we have a question from Cindy. Dr. Swingle, are there any addictions that do not have some neurological cause? Yes. And we were talking about that a bit earlier, and that is a condition in which uh, failure. Uh, individuals who have uh, lost their job, uh, can't find work, uh, individuals who uh, for some reason or other, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, life is not working out for them, uh, and, and it's a distraction, uh, uh, kill the pain kind of notion associated with, uh, uh, with the addictive behavior. Now, that can be something like a chemical, like uh, alcohol, or it can be something like spending your life sitting in front of a television set uh, where you're spending huge amount of time uh, distracting yourself. The notion of uh, self-medicating with food, for example, uh, again, there's uh, pretty decent evidence to indicate that uh, failure, uh, feelings of insufficiency and so forth uh, are Predispose, uh, predispose one to uh, the addictive behavior. Now, another variation on that, of course, is uh, uh, individuals who have been traumatized as children, uh, in which uh, their uh, emotional belief about themselves is uh, one of self-loathing. Uh, individuals in that kind of condition will, again, very often uh, be in a situation in which they can't relate to other individuals, and that's not because of a genetic condition now, that's because of uh, early childhood abuse in which the individual who should be associated with security is the source of danger. And under those conditions, the uh, way the child makes sense of that is <coughs> to uh, believe that they're deficient in some fashion. And it's the deficiency that gives rise to the problems associated with interpersonal interaction and so forth, all of which lead to feelings of failure, which of course can lead the individual into using some sort of chemical and or other form of uh, distraction. Okay, now, we talked about the depression marker, uh, and we're now going to be talking about an, another slight variation on that, and that is a condition in which, in addition to depression, an individual has a marker for emotional volatility, and that's what this one is. And the uh, situation here is an individual has the marker for depression, the one we talked about earlier, in which the right side of the brain is much more active than the left, but the person also has a marker for emotional volatility. And these are the individuals that are very highly emotional, 
have marked mood uh, swings and will very often uh, uh, be medicated, not so much for the uh, depression, but much more for uh, trying to control the uh, the marked uh, variation in mood states. <clears throat> These tend to be the individuals that are more prone to uh, become dependent on prescription medications as opposed to alcohol. So again, uh, in this case, we have a situation in which the brain maps will show us marked elevation of fast frequency over here and marked elevation of what's called theta amplitude, that is brain waves from three to seven cycles a second. Both markers, one for depression, one for mood volatility. I see that the flag goes up for uh, possibility of, of uh, being dependent on uh, prescription medications. And again, a situation in which the uh, right side of the brain is much more active than the left, and we have marked elevation of theta amplitude there. Okay, the genetic alcoholic is the one we just mentioned, and that's a situation in which we're not showing any of the deficiencies associated with depression or mood volatility. We're simply showing that marked deficiency in the back of the brain. This is what it looks like if you are taking a, what's called a topographic representation. And this is showing the uh, depression marker here, and that's where the left uh, side of the brain is underactive relative to the right. And here's the alcoholic signature right there. And that's uh, where we have a marked elevation of fast frequency in the back of the brain. Now, the characteristics associated with that is poor stress tolerance, can't find the switch to turn your brain off, predisposition to anxiety, an awful lot of chatter going on in the head, predisposition to self-medicating behavior, burnout, worn out uh, feelings, sleep quality problems, and so forth. Those are the symptoms associated with that. Okay, <laughs> emotional trauma. This is another major contributor to addictive behavior. You may recall from the earlier uh, let's see, let me go to slide uh, eighteen here. Okay. Now if you look here at the uh, where this is circled, this is alpha activity on top of the head between eyes open and eyes closed. The jump in alpha is about 50% oh, roughly. And here's the back of the brain, and there's eyes closed and eyes open, and that jump is 58% oh, or so. Okay. Now, If you look at this record, you'll notice that between eyes open and eyes closed, it goes negative. And here's the back of the brain, O1, eyes open, eyes closed, it goes negative. So it's exactly the opposite of what we just saw. This is the trauma marker. This, this is an individual who's been exposed to a severe emotional stressor. Where I discovered that was working with combat veterans over at McLean Hospital. They don't have any uh, alpha response. In fact, it goes strongly negative. Now, this makes a lot of sense neurologically because what it is is the brain's trying to protect itself against emotional flashbacks. So uh, these people are highly prone to self-medicating behavior, highly prone to alcoholism, drug use, and prescription medication abuse. And again, the reason for that is to try to get some relief 
from the horrifying experiences that they've been exposed to. Okay, Dr. Sengu, uh, could you eventually address food addiction? Uh, one of the participants says the food addiction has a history of childhood trauma as well as head injury then to PTSD. I've also had addiction to prescription drugs. Okay. Um, child abuse, uh, again, uh, can give rise to the trauma marker, the one that we were just looking at. It also can give rise to marked self-loathing. And again, for the reasons that I described earlier, if a child is abused by a parent, for example, the source of danger is coming from an individual who should be the uh, source of security. The only way the child can make sense of that at an unconscious level, I'm not talking about rational sense now, uh, is that there's something wrong with them. They are a deficient person. Now, uh, when you have that kind of setup, then individuals get involved with self-soothing behavior, and there's a fair amount of research that indicates that food addiction is an effort at self-soothing. Secondly, it can also be self-destructive in the sense that it is validating a feeling of self-loathing. Uh, individuals who uh, self-destruct uh, with uh, food addiction, for example, make them can uh, feel that they're making themselves unattractive to other individuals, and that provides them with some degree of of safety, if you think of it in those in that fashion. That is, nobody gets close enough to them to hurt them. Now, <clears throat> we often find that we have multiple. Uh, addictions and what you were referring to is uh, an issue associated with food and prescription medication. Uh, this is a combination we see very, very frequently. What we would do in this particular case is to see what is going on in terms of brain activity and make the corrections associated with the neurology of it and then do some behavioral or psychological therapy in order to help the individual change the behaviors that have been established. One of the things associated with addictive behavior is that the behavior can take on a life of its own. So that once you correct the neurology of it, you have to help the individual correct the behavior. A rough analogy of that is if an individual is afraid of elevators and we find that there's a neurological condition associated with uh, problems with anxiety, we correct that. But if the person never gets into an elevator, they will also behave as though they're afraid of elevators. That is, they'll take stairs and so forth. It's only by getting into the elevator and retraining themselves after you've taken care of the neurological condition that you take care of the behavior as well. Okay, so this is, of course, just a summary of that client we were talking about, the uh, one with the, uh, the trauma marker. Okay, so... Trauma, a deficiency on the top and the back, depression, elevation of this area of the brain relative to that, mood volatility, a problem in this area of the brain in terms of uh, elevated, very slow frequency activity. Neurological condition associated with poor stress tolerance and the genetic alcoholic notion is a deficiency in this area of the brain. What do we do about it? Okay. 
brain driving. This is a very aggressive treatment that we use. Uh, and when we're dealing with addiction, uh, we have a lot of, lot of issues that we have to deal with. If we're dealing with something like depression without addiction, that's pretty simple to take care of. <laughs> Basically, you get the brain sorted out, the, uh, the mood uh, condition changes, <laughs> and everybody goes home. Uh, a sleep disturbance where the individual has not become drug uh, habituated, that is habituated to uh, some sort of sedative, then basically we correct the area of the brain associated with the sleep problem and everybody goes home. Uh, where we have the problem with addiction is uh, that we have a lot of other things that are, are starting to, uh, that are problematic. We have the addiction itself and the behaviors that have built up around the addiction. Alcohol is a very good example of that. And one of the first statements I make to a client who comes in and tells me they have a problem with alcohol is I say to them, I cannot keep you sober on a bar stool. Now, the point of that is <clears throat> obvious. That is, uh, change takes effort. You have to modify the behavior that is uh, facilitating and enabling and exacerbating the addictive condition. Brain driving is aggressive treatment for changing the brain activity associated with the addictive behavior. Now, what brain driving is, is we measure the area of the brain associated with whatever problem it is we're trying to sort out. So for example, if we are concerned with depression in which this area of the brain is more active than that, one of the things we can do is we can arouse, that is make this area of the brain more active. If we are dealing with the genetic alcoholic that we were just talking about, we've got a problem right there in this area of the brain. So what we can do is we can correct the neurological condition that's associated with the predisposition to anxiety, poor stress tolerance, and self-medicating behavior. So here's where we're going to go to change the neurological condition associated with the genetic form of alcoholism. Now, <clears throat> brain driving refers to measuring the aspect of brain activity that we want to change and then using some sort of stimulation to nudge the brain into more normal functional ranges. Those of you who remember Pavlov and his dogs, and Pavlov was able to demonstrate that he could condition a dog to salivate by ringing a bell. And the way he did that is he rang a bell when he gave the dog meat powder. And soon the dog would salivate when he just rang the bell. You all remember that from... <clears throat> your psychology courses. Well, we do the same thing with the brain. We measure an aspect of brain functioning and then we use a stimulus that we know influences the brain in a particular way. And we can use things like lights. Here are lights that, uh, goggles that a person can look right through. And there are lights around the periphery of that. So for example, if we're trying to suppress elevated slow frequency in an ADD child, every time that brainwave gets too strong, we turn on those lights and suppress it. So that's what brain driving is. <clears throat> we have all kinds of stimulation that will affect brain activity. We have acupuncture points that we can use. We have sounds. We have lights. And this is what it looks like when we set a client up. 
uh, this lady has headsets on so we can present sounds. She has goggles on of the type I just showed you. She has uh, electrodes on acupuncture points here. And she has control of the intensity. So she can control the intensity of the stimulus, the stimulation that we're using. So there's no startle uh, effects. Okay, <clears throat> here's a genetic alcoholic. Here's that deficiency in the back of the brain. <clears throat> we want that number up in the range of about 1.8 to 2.2 or so. And here's what happened after a 30-minute session in which we are stimulating with lights at 7.8 cycles a second and some sound. <clears throat> and we are driving the brain up into a more uh, in, into an area in which the person can quiet themselves. Now, this is quite a dramatic change. Typically, we don't get anything nearly this strong. And, okay, so what we did was we put an electrode right there, and, and every time that slow frequency dropped below a training threshold, we turned on a light that flashed at 7.83 cycles a second and a sound that increases slow frequency amplitude. And we just kept pushing it. Every time it dropped too low, we pushed it again with lights and sound. It drops below, we push it with light and sound. Okay. And uh, that's the kind of changes that we can get. Again, this is a very marked change. It's typically maybe 20% or so. Okay. <clears throat> These are really problematic, severe problematic uh, addictions. And these are the people that are addicted to prescription medications. And before we get into this, I think you have another question there. Yes, we do. Would you say that there's single and uh, basis on addiction? Oddly enough, we do find that. We find that uh, when we're working with homogeneous groups, that some groups are more prone to particular kinds of uh, addictions. Uh, there are several ways you can look at this. A, uh, a neuroscientist by the name of Bloom uh, has been working with uh, the uh, alleles that are mechanisms for uh, synthesizing alcohol and so forth, and he finds that there's a big difference uh, among different races. Uh, we've done some work with what we call homogeneous groups, that is, uh, groups of uh, Native, <coughs> excuse me, Native Americans, individuals in uh, the Caribbean islands and so forth. And you find uh, that there are much higher uh, levels of uh, uh, deficiency. Well, deficiency is probably the wrong word, but uh, elevated fast frequency in the back of the brain uh, in some groups. Now, that may be a benefit under certain circumstances. If you're a hunting gathering uh, culture, then having something which uh, makes you highly distracted and high levels of uh, energy uh, would decidedly be an advantage. It may not be an advantage in a different kind of cultural setting. So the answer to that question is yes, you do find differences uh, among the different uh, homogeneous groups. And I'm sorry, I uh, had my microphone unmuted, uh, sorry, muted, so the participants didn't hear the question, but like Dr. Swinkel said, we were talking about the fact that uh, some races are more prone to addiction than others. And we have another question here from Mary. Don't you think that gambling and sex problems are just because people are weak-willed? Why call it a disease? I'm not crazy about the disease notion uh, either. Uh, I think every uh, behavior is a choice. Now, and 
at some point, no matter what your predisposition, you choose to pick up and drink. Whatever your predisposition, you choose to uh, bet on the lottery. Whatever your predisposition, you choose to turn on the television, I'm sorry, the, uh, the computer and go to a porn site or go to a game. Okay? There are decision points in every addictive behavior, obviously. Now, that's one side. The other is what are the severe predispositions to this kind of behavior? And if you have a condition in which you simply can't quiet yourself because of the neurology of it, you are much more prone to these conditions. So the notion of disease state <clears throat> uh, is associated with the notion that there is a neurological condition that is giving rise to your, uh, your predisposition to uh, addictive uh, behavior. The other aspect of that is the falsity that uh, these conditions refer to chemical imbalances mm -hmm. and that by using medication you're correcting the uh, chemical imbalance. There's virtually no uh, reasonable evidence that that's a viable uh, notion. Do you have neurological conditions in which uh, individuals find it more difficult to sleep? Yes, and those are the ones associated uh, with the deficiency in the back of the brain. They are correctable. And the problem with using a medication associated with this is you become addicted to the medication, and that's what we're looking at right here. This is an individual <clears throat> who has a marker for depression, and remember that's where the right side of the brain is markedly more active than the left, and here it is right here. The second thing is that there's a deficiency in the back of the brain, that is this person is prone to anxiety. The individual is taking copious amounts of medication over a long period of time and here's the marker for the problem associated with marked slowing of the brain associated with heavy medication use. This is the way I identified, if you remember that early case of the child who had, uh, had been smoking cannabis. His uh, alpha had slowed down markedly we want this below 1.5, so <clears throat> this person is in a lot of difficulty in terms of the addicting addiction to, uh, to the prescription medication. Now, brain driving. Brain driving is a very aggressive treatment, <clears throat> but look what happens if the individual is highly addicted and habituated to medication prescription medication. Here is the, the numbers prior to the brain driving. Here's the numbers after the brain driving. It hardly moves. So uh, the uh, brain is in a chemical soup and medication markedly increases the number of sessions that we need for neurological treatment of these conditions. As I said earlier, change takes effort. That's when uh, I think it was uh, Mary who uh, was talking about uh, why call it a disease, uh, it's a decision. And there's a lot of truth to that, you know, that uh, people choose to do specific things. Change takes effort. I can't keep you sober on a bar stool. You have to do things to change your own behavior. Now the second thing is part of that, and that is there are a lot of uh, areas in which uh, individuals are developing what they call harm reduction programs as opposed to uh, uh, eliminating the problem entirely. 
Now, <clears throat> harm reduction means that if an individual comes into a detox center, they <clears throat> dry the person out, try to give him some encouragement to uh, slow down on his drinking, uh, try to get him hooked up with AA and so forth. Uh, the alternative to that is to correct the addiction uh, and eliminate the behavior. Uh, harm reduction procedures, of course, are very important. You know, you want to reduce the HIV issue and so forth and so on. But the notion that you're going to simply uh, try to assist the person in reducing the damage that they're doing uh, as your first uh, therapeutic goal, in my judgment, is a mistake. The first therapeutic goal is to eliminate the addiction. Okay, Internet. Here's the profile of a severe Internet addict. Now, and there's no marker for depression here. There's no marker for emotional volatility. There's a marker for the poor stress tolerance in the back of the brain, but there's something else here, and that is a marked disparity in alpha. Now, let's see what that actually means. What we find with Internet addicts is a condition that's very similar to what we find in autism and Asperger's. Now, I'm being making a generalization here, which may not prove uh, to hold up after we collect a lot more data, but this is what we're finding, and that is you get a large increase of a uh, uh, imbalance in alpha activity in the right side of the brain relative to the left. Now, what that is, is in a very young child, if you see it, you talk to the parents about oppositional and defiant behavior. When you see it in an adult, you talk to them about some problems with getting along with individuals interpersonally. We find this in social phobia as well, in which there's a deficiency in the back of the brain, just like your genetic alcoholic, a deficiency back there, they can't quiet themselves, and the uh, imbalance in the front part of the brain in which this area of the brain has much more alpha activity than that. So there's an interpersonal issue and a problem with being able to quiet. So, <clears throat> And the, let me just go back, there's that uh, deficiency, of the uh, I'm sorry, imbalance in the alpha with the right side being considerably greater than the left and, and the uh, deficiency in the back of the brain, which is a problem with self-quieting. Prevalence of uh, Internet addiction, <clears throat> about 5% of adolescents, 6 to 15% of the general population. Internet addiction is very interesting. It's inversely related to education. That is, uh, college students, uh, individuals, college educations and so forth, at least at this point, higher, excuse me, higher uh, prevalence. The items to identify internet addiction, uh, your school or work performance suffers, you're defensive or secretive about the time on or what is done online. That sounds like an alcoholic hiding his bottle of booze. You block out thoughts with online use. There's your distraction factor. So you're really uh, unhappy with yourself or uh, <clears throat> Uh, depressed, then you block out all of that by going online. 
fear that life without the internet would be boring, empty, and joyless. Boy, if that doesn't sound like an alcohol, I can't imagine not ever having a drink again. What am I going to do, sit around and drink Coca-Cola with a lot of boring people? I mean, that's what you hear from alcoholics. <clears throat> Interrupt the uh, addictive behavior and the person gets angry. Okay. You lose sleep associated with your addiction. You fantasize about internet use. You try and fail to cut down on the use of internet. Sound like an alcoholic? I've tried everything. I've tried geographical relocations. I've tried limiting the kind of stuff that I drink. I've tried uh, drinking more expensive uh, uh, alcohol, but less of it, etc., etc., etc. That's exactly what you're getting here. They try all kinds of mechanisms for trying to uh, cut down on the uh, use. Okay, so this certainly sounds like addiction. And I get a lot of parents come in and say, if I take, uh, try to take the uh, computer away from the child, they uh, become extremely aggressive. They start hitting me. They uh, punch the wall. I mean, very, very serious condition. Consequences of Internet addiction, financial debt, work school implications, suicidal ideations, lack of meaningful relationships. So this is what I'm picking up with that, uh, with the brain activity associated with some forms of internet addiction. That's the one I just showed you in which there's <clears throat> the elevated alpha in the right side of the brain, which is the social uh, 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 problem, uh, the difficulty with uh, developing uh, relationships and so forth. <clears throat> Internet's a very interesting uh, addiction because it wasn't too long ago that we reinforced children for spending time on the computer. You know, when you were my age and your kids came in, I mean, I didn't know even how to turn on a computer, much less play games and so forth. And they would go up on the computer and everybody would be praising the child. Oh, he's learning how to use the computer. He's really good at it. He's really skilled at it. <clears throat> uh, the other is uh, you have a lot of individuals who switch from substances to what they consider to be a safer addiction, which is going online on the various uh, porn sites and so forth. <clears throat> uh, comorbid substance abuse is slightly higher in the Internet addicted populations. Uh, the data are not clear on that yet, and uh, my feeling is that if you take care of the conditions that are associated with the internet addiction, you probably take care of the comorbid ones anyway. Eating, internet, there are some addictions that are really difficult to deal with. Uh, eating addiction is a good example. You know, you can't tell a person to stop eating. So you have to modulate a necessary behavior. Individuals who work on the uh, computer, uh, how do you get them into controlled use. Now, here's where the harm reduction issue uh, seems to be more relevant, and that is that you try to change a behavior from a pathological behavior to a more normal behavior so that you eat normally and you the computer normally, if we can use that terminology. Well, I see that we have come to the end of our first hour, and I'd like to thank you all for uh, dropping in, and uh, we will be doing this on a routine basis, uh, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you, everyone, for joining in, and uh, I will be sending announcement to everybody about our next webcast. Thank you again. Have a good weekend, and we will see you next time.